Hey, I'm Chris F for Make Everything, and today we're making a custom cedar closet and we're installing it. Check it out. All right, so getting started with this project, I designed it based on the use of three quarter inch cedar veneered plywood. Um, it was something that I knew I could get locally, but turns out a lot of people have never heard of. I get a lot of questions about that, about this project. So this is just, um, it's three quarter inch, you know, regular three quarter inch plywood with the aromatic cedar veneered on both sides. Um, it was pretty clean, very stable. All the pieces were really flat. So me and Macklin just ripped them up on the table saw to get the uh, general rips down. And then we sorted through the material. The client had some specifications as to how they wanted the closet to look. So we just went through all the boards and made sure that we didn't have too much of that uh, sapwood streaks. And I had a cut list and a pretty elaborate drawing of the closet already done. So I was able to go through and label the pieces so I knew, you know, which was going to be a side panel, which was going to be, you know, facing out and which was going to be shelves. So it's helpful to have a second set of hands here to move these around and sort of get the shop organized. Now, once that was done, it was about cutting up my shelf parts. And this can be one of the most time consuming parts of building any sort of cabinet. Um, now for this purpose, I used my 18 volt, or this is actually a 36 volt Makita track saw. It uses the two batteries instead of one. Um, and you'll see I put the pink foam down underneath it. And what's nice about this setup is that I'm able to just lay my boards down and mark out my cuts, drop my track on there, cross cut. I don't have to worry about the depth of anything. Um, and I can just make all my shelf cuts and move on to the next one. So um, this is, you know, sort of the first time I'm using the track saw for this purpose. Uh, normally I would just use my table saw and cross cut shelf parts like this or use the miter saw if I can. But I felt like this gave me the best result that I've ever gotten um, when doing this operation. So this whole setup that I got here, um, I don't have a uh, track square. They make things that clip onto your track that give you a perfect 90 degree here. I don't have one of those. So what I did was I drilled some holes in my track and I countersank these uh, number six by three quarter inch screws. And I checked to make sure this was perfectly 90. I did some test cuts beforehand. So now all I have to do is register this up, get it nice and tight, and only go off of one mark. Um, I always go off of two marks anyway because I just want to be 100% sure. But this is a great reference guide and it makes sure that I'm nice and close. And the big thing that this prevents is that, and I, you know, I'm sure everybody's done this at least once. You know, let's say your measurement is 20 and a half. So you'll pull 20 and a half off the bottom and on the top, you'll pull 21 and a half. Um, and then, you know, if you don't, if you're, a hurry, if you're in a hurry and you're not, you know, sort of checking your work, it's really easy to even be off by a quarter, be off by, you know, a whole inch, whatever it is. So with this reference square here, um, it does make it pretty much perfect every time. But not only that, it keeps me from making a careless error. Um, and I don't really mind that I drilled a couple of holes in my track because once I take this thing off, the track isn't going to be affected at all. So I got to finish and finish cutting up this last piece. So that little track guide thing worked out really well. Um, and then on this last cabinet, I actually didn't measure. I just used the previous shelf as a guide and I had used a um, box cutter to just score the shelf. And then once I was all cut up, this was about 50 different pieces in terms of all the shelves and the uh, cabinet sides. Um, but everything was able to be cut up really quickly with that track saw set up. Now the next stage in this, um, the client decided that they did not want adjustable shelves. So I devised a way to make a router jig to route a rabbit in the shelf side panels 
Um, and I felt that this would be the fastest and most efficient way for me to do it. So you'll see what I did there was I screwed a piece of scrap material down to my table. And now I'm using this track guide uh, that I made. And this is just a piece of, um, it's three quarter inch plywood and then some half inch MDF. I actually have a whole build video showing how I built this router sled. Uh, and there'll be a link to that in the description. And what this router sled allows me to do is it allows me to hook up a vacuum and use a three quarter inch bearing guide rabbiting bit to get a perfect shelf rabbit uh, in these side panels. And this was critical for this project because, you know, one of the largest sections of time um, is in these shelf rabbits. And this is also the place where you can lose the most material. So, you know, if you make one mistake when you're cutting in shelf rabbits like this, you'll lose your side panels and the side panels take up the most material out of everything on the project. So I really wanted to make sure that I didn't lose any material on this. The three quarter inch veneered plywood that I'm using for this project costs about $150 a sheet. So if I make one mistake in a side panel, it's a $150 mistake. With this setup though, I was able to really quickly just measure off of the previous shelf, use this guide. Obviously I'm checking everything and making sure everything's nice and square, but by using this guide, I, I'm able to rip both of the side panels at the same time, which also is another way to avoid errors. Um, this lets me know that everything's gonna line up and be nice and square when I put these two pieces together. So you can see how I'm pushing against that piece of scrap material that's on the table and then just measuring off the next, you know, off the previous shelf and running the whole setup again. All in all, this worked out really well to, you know, get these in. Um, the three quarter inch bit that I used was pretty tight on this particular material. You know, usually three quarter inch plywood slightly oversized, but I think because of the properties of this veneer, this actually measured a tiny bit heavy over three quarter, which was nice. It gave me a really nice interference fit on all these shelves. In order for me to get the shelves in, I actually had to bevel the edges um, that went inside the rabbits, which was good. It made sure that everything stayed really nice and tight. So I'm just using a, a cordless belt sander to just bevel the edges and that's not going to be seen because the whole thing is going to get a face frame on it and all the the nosings of the shelves are going to hide any of those bevels but just as a test fit i wanted to bevel everything and you know bang this thing together and just make sure it all fit together before i glued it it's important to do that kind of test fit on something like this especially because this was the first time i had used that particular jig i wanted to make sure that everything stayed nice and square but you can see even without glue, the whole thing is really tight and stayed together really well. Now that I know it's going to work, I brought it over to the other side of my bench and I laid it down on a piece of the veneer plywood to keep it from getting damaged in case there was any imperfections on my actual worktop. Taking the shelves back out, getting myself some glue. Um, I'm cleaning out everything and just adding glue to all these rabbits and putting all the shelves back in place, making sure everything's nice and tight and square. Um, I had also established which was gonna be the front of the cabinet at this point, which is the side facing me. And I just am prioritizing all those shelves so that they're nice and tight with the front. I'm not so worried about the back because they're gonna get a uh, quarter inch um, cedar veneered plywood on the back as the back of the shelving unit. So uh, if there's a little gap there, I can close that up with the, with the backing. So just adding my glue, making sure that everything's positioned nice and knocking it all in place. And there were a couple of spots where I could add fasteners, um, but for the most part, I left this thing just with glue and the, the friction of the rabbits and that held it together really well. the side that I'm putting those screws in is going to be up against the wall. So it's no big deal that I add a couple of fasteners there. Same thing with the top where I just added those nails. There's going to be a crown that goes up to the ceiling so you won't see those. 
And here I just decided to uh, make some little spreader bars for the bottom of the cabinet, just so that when I let this sit and dry overnight, there wasn't any chance of that plywood warping. I didn't want it to cup in. So these are just screwed into the end grain of the plywood, and these will come out once I make the other section of the shelving unit. Making sure everything's flat and square. Now again, back over to the router jig. Here I'm just making the bottom half of that shelving unit. So one of the critical points on this project was that the, um, the unit is pretty much bigger than the rest of the rooms in the apartment in terms of like the height. It just is gonna fit inside the closet. We really wanted to maximize the space and maximize the closet. So I had to build it in a way that it would be able to be brought into the apartment in pieces and then reassembled inside the closet um, without leaving too much room to spare. You know, I didn't want to leave big gaps for the face frames. I want everything to be tight. So a lot of the way this is built is, you know, has that in mind where it's going to be able to be disassembled and reassembled. Um, and here I'm using the Craig jig to assemble the sort of desk side of this closet. Um, and I decided to use the Craig jig here because the this is gonna have drawers. So I feel it's acceptable to have pocket screws inside a setup where you have drawers because the drawers will shroud anyone from ever seeing the pocket screws. So here I'm just building the little side section um, and I'm using these Craig 90 degree clamps to hold my boards up and then I'm driving in the pocket screws. These things are actually super convenient. Um, since doing this project, I, I've seen now online that Craig has upgraded these clamps and now they're a little easier to adjust. I think that um, I'm gonna be getting a pair of the new ones as well just because for building cabinets, especially out of three quarter inch plywood, these corner clamps were really awesome. Um, so I'm just putting in the pocket screws on these shelves and again, these are gonna have drawers on them. Um, so it's pretty straightforward assembly on these. I use a spacer block anytime I do something like this where all the shelves have to be the same size. It just makes sure that everything's gonna be consistent. I don't have to think about you know lining the shelves up. It also helps with pocket screws because they have a tendency of wanting to pull the material and move it around. If you have a solid spacer in there, it kind of stops them from doing that. And now the way that this uh, desk gets assembled is the, the drawer unit acts as a spacer in between the bottom and the top of the desk. So I'm just using pocket screws again over here with that little right angle drill to attach the drawer unit to the bottom of the desk section. And then this will be the desk top. Again, using those 90 degree clamps just to uh, keep everything tight while I get those pocket screws in there. And this whole unit gets attached to the shelving unit that I just made on the other side of the bench. And now I can take this, the stretcher bars off of there and I can do a test assembly. And I'm doing a test assembly up on the table because the floor in my shop is really out of level, but I know my table is dead flat. I actually redid my table right before this project and I added um, a lot more support to it to make sure that it was nice and flat because I wanted to make sure that this project wasn't negatively affected by my table being warped. So now that I know it's going to go together, I take it all apart um, and put it off to the side and I start building the second section of the closet. Now again, I'm using my router, my router jig and I'm using that piece of scrap material that's screwed into the table. And I'm just routing in my shelf grooves again. At this point, I had done enough of these where I had really good control over the jig and, and this part went a lot faster than the first section. And again, now I'm using that belt sander to just bevel those edges. Um, I did try this jig with like some standard three quarter inch plywood from like the Home Depot. And uh, since the regular three quarter inch plywood is undersized, it there definitely was a lot more slop in there. But for this application, it worked out really, really well. And um, on this one, I didn't show the test assembly, but I did dry fit everything before I added the glue. 
and now I'm just putting this together. Now, what's different about this shelving unit as opposed to the other one is that it's got shelves rabbited in on both sides. So I actually had to make the depth of the rabbit a little bit shallower so that I wouldn't take away too much material from that center board. Um, I didn't want to cause a weak point there, so I just made the rabbit about an eighth of an inch instead of a full quarter of an inch because I didn't want to take too much of that material away. And here you'll see I was able to add some screws inside the rabbit points that are on both sides of that center board. Um, and that's just like a good little trick to make sure things stay nice and tight. As long as you sink the screws deep enough, you don't have to worry about them affecting the rabbit. So you can see I was able to put in that board and then I'll put in this shelf and then the lower shelf as well. Just making sure everything's nice and tight and knocking it in. Using a couple of pin nails here just to make sure that everything stays in there. And just checking to make sure everything's nice and square and exactly the right size. I had left this top board a little bit long, so I, I had um, marked it out and cut it down. And then this I'm able to screw in from the sides because it's going to be hidden. And same thing with the bottom. The bottom I'm able to use nails and screws just because you're not going to see it. And now again, I'm making some... Spending some time here just like putting screws into the side. Anything that's not going to be seen, any side that's not going to be seen, I'm able to use fasteners. Um, the glue is definitely strong enough, but I like to use screws where I can. And here since the, uh, since the side of this closet has to be assembled on site, I wasn't able to do a sort of hidden fastener system for there. So I had to put a piece of wood. Um, I marked that out and then it basically put me into the task where I had to plane down my cedar. Um, I was able to buy four quarter rough cut cedar from my lumber yard where I got the cedar veneer plywood. It took a lot of cleaning up to make it usable. It was a little unfortunate. Uh, the selection wasn't so great. So what I'm about to do here is I'm gonna use the track saw to square up these boards so that I have a nice reference angle for when I'm gonna rip these on the table saw. So the track is gonna give me a perfectly straight cut and uh, minimize the amount of waste. So using the track saw as basically a joiner here, um, like I just explained, I'm able to make the best out of the material, like I said, was not so great. Uh, it took a lot of cleaning up to really get it usable and there was a good amount of waste just in um, pieces of this material that were totally blown out and full of knots. So with the track saw, I was able to clean it up and then take it over to the table saw and rip down my nosings and all my other solid wood material that I needed. And I leave my nosings a little bit oversized so that there's a little bit of a lip. Um, and then that's all sanded down and, and looks nice. And here, like I was marking out before, this is just a little shelf support. And this is just going to be attached with glue and nails and have a mirrored version on the other side so that when the sideboard gets installed, uh, the shelf can sit on top of it and have a nice bit of support. Again, countersinking and using screws anywhere that I can that's not going to be seen. And here you can see um, that little shelf support and basically just a small shelf is going to sit on there. Now I can add the top shelves. So now that that section is done, I basically just muscle it off the table. And I had built these dollies. Uh, they're basically just two by fours to have a nice rigid frame and then they're on two dollies and what that gives me is another nice flat reference surface for me to continue to work on these cabinets without having to have them up on the table and it also makes them obviously a lot more mobile. So 
now I can test assemble everything again um, and sort of work on the finishing touches, but have them able to be rolled around the shop and not warp with my uneven floor. There's just one more cabinet section that I have to make, which is the top of the um, triple cabinet. And the way that I did this was I just did glue and screws from the top because obviously you won't see it if it's up against the ceiling. Um, and I found that this is plenty strong. These are also going to get pocket screwed down into the top of the cabinet. So it's not, there's not really a huge factor of force on them to move them. The biggest, um, challenge here is just making sure that everything lines up and stays nice and square. And here I'm just using some brad nails too. The brad nails just help keep anything from shifting. Um, this is a method that I use a lot whenever I build any sort of cabinet that I can have screws and fasteners that, you know, are on and on a hidden side. And here you can see how it just lays on top of there. And then it's got some pocket screws that are gonna drive it down into the cabinet. And now I'm working on more of the nosings. Um, I'm using this hedgehog feather board. If you guys saw my giveaway, then you'll see that uh, I talked a little bit about this. This was the first project that I used this feather board on and I found it was like awesome. The, the boards that I was ripping, they had a lot of variation in them. So it was really important to me to be able to adjust the feather board with one hand, you know, as the material was maybe shrinking or even growing, I was able to just quickly adjust that feather board so that it worked. Um, it definitely helps with safety and it definitely helps with accuracy to make sure you get a nice cut. So I'm just ripping down these nosings. I'm leaving them nice and long and then I'll go back and cut them. Um, my method for attaching these nosings is I'm just using 23 gauge pins and glue. The cedar is soft enough where it more or less absorbs those little pins and it's nearly impossible to see the fasteners. Um, just I use a couple of clamps here and there, but you know, 99% of this is just 23 gauge pins. They're inch and a quarter long, um, so that gives me a good uh, half an inch of grab inside the material. And I'm using Type Bond too, which I found has a great tack. You know, it tacks up really quickly. It's perfect for this application. And um, I'm not really doing much measuring. I'm mainly you know putting in my pieces, and then I'm adding an oversized piece, scribing it, and cutting it. Uh, now that the nosings are done on this shelf, I did the back panels. So the back panels also had to coincide with the way that the shelves are built in pieces. So you see I had to measure out in different sections. Um, and here I'm just using quarter inch, one side veneered plywood, and the track saw to rip it up. And again, I'm using this pink foam as a cutting substrate, which allows me to just rip right through the material, right into the foam. I don't have to worry about dulling my blade. Um, it really makes the process of using a track saw so much easier when you buy one of these pieces of foam. I highly recommend it. Now to attach the back panels, I'm using um, inch and a quarter, 18 gauge crown staples. And I found that the staples hold on cabinet backs much better than um, brad nails do. So I'm just applying these and uh, what I'm doing before I, I get too crazy with the staples, I'm making sure I know where all my shelves are. The last thing I want is a staple to blow through the back of the cabinet and be seen. Um, so I'm just being really careful that I only put staples where I know there's a shelf. Um, and I'm, I'm applying a good amount of staples because I don't want the back to come off. And now that that one's done, I'm able to wheel the old, the other section of the closet over and get to working on this one. And now this one, I started with the back panel because I already had the track saw set up. So there wasn't really, um, wasn't really a reason to do the nosings right away. So again, here I'm just making sure that my back panels coincide with 
where the dividers are and the way that the you know the whole closet is going to come apart and now i can do a little work on the nosings on that one the next step for me was to work on the drawers so i'm using i'm using half inch plywood for the drawer sides i'm using quarter inch material for the bottom so i just set up some stop locks on my miter saw and i cut up all my drawer sides And then since I'm using quarter inch material for the drawer bottoms, I set up a dado stack on my table saw and I rip a groove into all my drawer sides so that I can get that uh, drawer bottom rabbited in there. And I decided to use the quarter inch uh, aromatic cedar for the drawer bottoms. I just thought it'd give it a nice look and a nice effect. And for the drawer faces, I'm also using the, the aromatic cedar three quarter inch plywood and they're going to be edge banded. Um, initially, I wanted to use solid cedar, but because the material that I could get was really you know, not up to par, I felt that it would be best to just use the plywood again. And now for assembling my drawer boxes, I'm using brad nails and glue. And then I'm sliding in that quarter inch drawer bottom and adding the back. This is a really simple method for building drawers. Uh, I found that it still leaves a really, I like a really nice strong drawer. This is half inch Baltic birch. It's really stable plywood. So I build my drawer boxes. I make sure I sand the top edges and you know, just move on to the next one. It's a very repetitive process, but I found that it gives really consistent results. Now that I have the drawers in, I'm using my right angle drill to get these drawer slides installed. Now my method for installing drawer slides is really simple. I have a spacer block that I put in the drawer um, and then I add my drawer slides on top of the spacer block and I screw them into the sides of the cabinet. Then I use another spacer block underneath the drawer box. I pull out the slide and screw that into the drawer box itself. I found that I can pretty much do these consistently with no adjustments just by using these little spacers. Um, I am very cautious as to how deep I place the drawer slide into the cabinet. It's sort of specific to you know what you're doing. In my case, I had a three quarter inch face going on these drawers and a three quarter inch nosing. So I made sure all my drawer slides were spaced back three quarters of an inch and I didn't have to adjust a single drawer on this project. So this is just a really quick and easy way to install drawer slides just by using some scrap wood. Um, the right angle drill here is also really, really helpful for this application because you can get it in there on these tight, um, on these tight drawers and these tight cabinets. So, you know, they make adapters for a regular drill. I definitely think if you have to make small drawers like this, these are about 12 inches wide, definitely look into that. Um, and you can see I left my drawer box boxes pretty tall. I wanted them to, you know, be able to hold as much stuff as they possibly could. It's all about efficiency on this closet and maximizing the storage. And now moving on to the other side, you can see, you know, again, me using these little pieces of wood to attach these drawer slides. Um, again, really simple. I'm just using those spacers. I use the same spacers just on their sides when I'm doing the drawer section of the slide installation. Now that all the drawer slides are installed, I'm measuring for my drawer faces. Um, I don't like to do this until everything is pretty much done. So now I'm just making sure that I have really precise measurements of my drawer faces. Every drawer face, you know, on a project like this, every drawer face was a tiny, tiny bit different. So I just made sure that everything was marked out and I spent a lot of extra time just making sure everything was cut correctly. I'm also taking into account the thickness of the edge banding. Um, I want there to be like a 16th inch reveal around the drawers and I have to assume that the edge banding is going to add some material. So I have to undersize my cuts just a little bit. And I'm just ripping and cross cutting everything on the table saw for these.
Now to edge band these, I actually had to uh, get cedar edge banding, um, raw cedar edge banding, and then I'm using the fast cap, um, fast edge tape for this. Now fast cap makes a couple of uh, different really good edge banding products. And one of the things that I wasn't able to use was their quad trimmer, um, which is an edge banding trimmer. You'll see I have to cut the edge banding with a knife. Uh, that was just because the cedar veneer, uh, the edge banding that I bought from the local hardwood supplier was too thick. So basically I'm just applying the double stick tape. I'm applying the edge banding and I'm rolling it because it's a pressure sensitive tape. And then I'm trimming all my edge banding with their flush trimmer and then I'm using a knife to cut the edges. Um, this was a really straightforward and easy way to edge band these drawers. It came out really nice. Um, the fast edge tape I found to be really, really strong. Like you can't pull this stuff off without totally delaminating the wood. Um, it's a really impressive product. I definitely think if you want to get away from doing iron on edge banding, you look into the fast cap edge tape. And these little uh, plastic things that I have screwed down to the table are another fast cap product and they just hold on to your three quarter inch shelf so that you can work on it without having to try and stand it up. This isn't a sponsored video or anything, but I just like this product and it really saved me a ton of time. So again, I'm just applying the tape, applying the edge banding, I'm rolling everything, making sure everything's nice and flush and tight. Um, and I did this for all 10 of the drawer faces. And now that the drawer faces are done, I just go over and I use uh, some 220 grit sandpaper on an orbital sander and I just round over all those edges and make sure everything looks nice and clean. The big thing with edge banding is I want it to basically disappear. I don't want you to be able to tell that there's a piece glued on there. So I want everything to blend nice and some 220 sandpaper can really make sure that that happens. Here's how I like to do drawer fronts. Take a hot glue gun, take the drawer front, put some spacers underneath the drawer front, put two dabs of hot glue, stick the drawer front on, and then you go back in and use screws. So doing these drawer fronts this way with the hot glue is something that I've been doing for a while. Um, I found it works really well. Uh, the little cordless hot glue gun that I'm using there is also like a really great, great, great tool to have in your toolkit. Um, it's like 30 bucks from Home Depot. And yeah, it's Ryobi and it uses Ryobi batteries, but uh, to have a cordless glue gun on a job site, you would be surprised how much stuff you'll use it for. Um, something that I didn't do on the last set of drawers was I didn't add any tape to pull the drawers back open, so I had a bit of a struggle to get those open afterwards. But again, I'm just using the hot glue and uh, gluing those drawer fronts on with some spacers. And uh, again, like I explained, I'm just using business cards as spacers for my drawer fronts. And that gives me enough of a clearance around them um, so that they open and close really smoothly. Now, the nice thing about the hot glue is, you know, I can position all these drawers. And if I realize that I have a problem, then if I realize that I have a problem, then I can always just pop them off. And I can also sort of streamline the process of, of doing the work because now that you know I'm hot gluing all the drawers and then I'm going back and I'm screwing them in all from the back at once so it's less time you know putting down tools and picking them back up so once we install these drawer fronts though these cabinets are basically built and they're you know we've done all we can inside the shop and the rest of it will be done on site uh, you'll see that there's some edges that are off on the sides and on the bottom of the cabinet and that's because we're going to do all that stuff when we get to the house all right so now we're in the client space this is the closet and you can see it's pretty tight um, i'm shooting this with a fisheye lens so it sort of distorts the room and makes it seem a, a lot bigger than it is but you'll see when we get the cabinets in there how tight everything is now getting the cabinets into the apartment was a little bit of a challenge but Getting them into the closet was more of a challenge. Now the the floor and the walls were out of level and out of square, so I left a good amount of room for shimming, and we had to do a little bit of messing around with these to get all the joints nice and tight. Um, I had come and done field measurements prior, but you never really know how uh, the floor and the walls are going to affect your cabinets until you get on site.
and you can see how tight we are uh, both on the left and the right and on the ceiling but you know that was the point of this project was to really maximize the amount of storage space that we could get out of this small closet and here you can see how that little desk feature goes in on the right and here the floor was a lot more out of level so we had to do some pretty significant shimming underneath it but anytime we do a project like this bring a lot of extra material and a lot of tools so that we can more or less fabricate anything we need on site and here was probably the most challenging piece to fit in was that tall cabinet it just fit by about a quarter of an inch oh it's perfect and now there's a certain amount of pocket screws that are going to be installed just to make sure everything's nice and tight. And you can see that we didn't put any of the nosings on on the tall cabinet. And that was because I wanted to first add the face frame on the left side of the cabinet and scribe it to the wall and then add the, uh, add the nosing. So all in all, this was a pretty straightforward installation. We didn't really have any major problems. Um, there was definitely some intricate scribe work that we had to do and we had to fight with the cabinets a little bit but in terms of things that can go wrong on an installation the list is very long and we were very fortunate on this one and um, we didn't have a lot of problems and that's it let's take some look at the closet The total installation took about six hours, but it came out really nice. And um, I'm really happy with how this project came out. It looks great in the room and it's it's really like the most efficient use of this space, I think, with the combination of the drawers, the hanging, and the shelves. All right, that about does it for this one. This was a long project. It was exhausting, um, but I'm really happy with how it came out. Thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to check out our Instagram, at Make Everything Shop. If you want to see behind the scenes stuff, when we do a project like this, there was a lot of stuff on the story, a lot of photos that I posted throughout the build of these. Uh, the link to the router sled that I used in this, uh, the video for that is in the description. If you want um, more info about the shop, if you want any Make Everything gear, check out our website. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel, and uh, we'll see you on the next video. All right, thanks.